So good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyagahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jokjoge, or Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Before we begin our School of Health colloquium, Tobacco Control and Child Health, I would just like to ask all attendees to save your questions and enter them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to answer all questions at the end of the talk. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Marta Rado, who is an assistant professor at Karolinska Institute in Sweden and a visiting researcher here at McGill University. Over to you, Marta. Thank you, Emily. So I will share my screen. Um, do you see that my screen changes? Yes, we do. Okay, super. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, a little bit about my background. So I'm I have a PhD in sociology and a graduate degree in statistics and uh, applied uh, for uh, understanding the social factors for child health and health inequalities. And I will talk a little bit about this. So, um, uh, and uh, before I talk about it, let me introduce you Baby Anne, who is, um, uh, uh, was, her mother attended uh, prenatal visits really regularly, and then she was born uh, in April. 29, so she's almost one year old, and she had really good health outcomes for term with good weight and everything what you want. So, um, yeah, the big question is that what is the risk for baby M to get hospitalized with some lung disease? And yeah, her health outcomes are really, really good. Uh, respiratory, uh, the negative respiratory outcomes are quite common. So, Maybe there is some risk, but nothing alarming here. And um, if I tell you some additional information about baby Ann, baby Ann is living in a country which has no uh, tobacco control policy at place uh, and uh, uh, in a low and middle income country and they're surrounded by people who smoke. So mother smoke, father smoke, the neighbor smokes. And um, from a, a household which has low income, uh, so these are like the social factors uh, for baby M. And this is the core of my interest uh, beyond the previously mentioned factors. So this might modify what we think of baby M's risk for getting hospitalized with respiratory disease. So let's see. Um, I will talk about uh, two projects uh, which I had. The first one was uh, mm, that I conducted while I was at Erasmus MC in the Netherlands. Uh, and this was about estimating the effect of tobacco control policies on child health and survival. And the next one is something which I'm currently doing. Uh, and this project um, is about estimating the smoking, the, the impact of social networks on smoking inequities. So first, the tobacco control policies. So this is not going to be very surprising for you, but smoking is really, really bad for the health. It's the leading preventable cause of uh, premature mortality and morbidity. And uh, be beyond the smokers, there are people who uh, are also negatively impacted by smoking, and that uh, that is um, that are the children. Uh, who have, uh, in general, low ability to control their own exposure. So we need to protect them, uh, particularly them, uh, about uh, tobacco control policies, uh, about to to the harm of tobacco. Uh, and uh, tobacco control policies are really good measures for, for this. But uh, uh, there is uh, still, in 78% of the world population is not protected by a comprehensive smoke-free policy, which means that a smoke-free policy which covers all public um, enclosed places. 
such as hospitals, schools, uh, governmental buildings. Um, and 86% uh, of the bird population is still living in um, a country without the sufficiently high taxes uh, defined by the Bird Health Organization. So there is way to go to extend these policies to uh, um, other countries or uh, regions which doesn't have sufficiently uh, good measures. But there were uh, some knowledge gaps um, in this uh, topic. And the first one was um, that there, uh, we saw it in a lot of high income countries that um, these measures are really effective for protecting child health. But it was still unknown whether these measures are uh, pr um, like working in low and middle income countries uh, where other air pollution uh, might be higher, uh, where the knowledge of tobacco related harm may be lower, and there are different cultural aspects about toping and smoking also. So this was one question. And the other question was, uh, that we always looked into uh, enclosed public places, and the, the, these are this is the definition of comprehensive smoke-free policy based on the WHO. But there are a lot of countries, uh, including Canada, which started to, to introduce uh, policies, um, uh, uh, smoke-free policies to private or outdoor places, for example, to uh, private cars or playgrounds. So um, there, there were some evidence, but the systematic re overview was missing. So this is what we, we did. So first, this is a, uh, one of our publication about smoke rip policies in infant, uh, on the impact of smoke rip policies on infant mortality in uh, multiple middle income countries. And uh, here are the two uh, senior authors on the project, Jasper Wien and Frank Van Lent. And um, basically what we did, uh, what we should do if we wanted to estimate this policy, ideally what we would do is that we would have a country like Thailand and investigate this country uh, with the legislation and then have the same country at the same time without the legislation. Well, I don't need to detail why this is impossible, so we cannot have a country at the same time, at the same uh, country, uh, observing it with and without uh, legislation. So we could have another strategy. Uh, we could randomly select countries and introduce uh, the legislation in these countries. And then uh, the other countries don't introduce these policies. So this is a, like conduct a randomized uh, trial. Uh, but this is also not really feasible. Um, I cannot really tell to countries that you should uh, introduce this policy or not. Even with the evidence, uh, it's really hard, but let alone uh, just for the sake of research. So this is uh, not really feasible and not even ethical. So the second thing is that we could have Thailand, which introduced the policy and compare it with another country without the policy. But again, this is not really feasible. Uh, because um, or, yeah, because there is no other country like Thailand, we cannot really find like uh, a comparable country. China and Malaysia, let's say they are a bit similar, but they are not the same. So the next strategy, and that's what we did actually, is that we um, uh, had a country which introduced the policy, that's Thailand, and we had um, bunch of other countries which didn't introduce this policy and based on them, like Bangladesh, China, Bhutan, and Malaysia, and based on them, we created a synthetic Thailand, which is like 20% Bangladesh, 50% Malaysia, and 30% uh, uh, China, let's say. Uh, so then we had the real Thailand, uh, which introduced the policy, and a synthetic Thailand based on countries which uh, haven't introduced this policy. Uh, and this is just to say it in an other way, mathematically. So the synthetic uh, Thailand would be the weighted combination of the control countries. 
And then we would compare this Thailand and uh, the synthetic Thailand in the post-legislation period uh, and see how they uh, differ. And that would be the policy impact. So this is what we did here. And we did this not only for Thailand, but for 34 uh, countries, uh, which introduced the smoke-free legislation. And we could find a good synthetic control for 22 of them. And here in figure one, you can see the findings. So what you see here is that there is the mortality in one of the axes and the time from implementation in the other axis. This vertical line is uh, when the policy was introduced. Uh, the red, red lines are infant mortality. Uh, the blue lines are neonatal mortality. And the solid line is um, uh, the the average of the intervention countries, which introduce the policy. And the dashed line is the average of the synthetic control countries. Uh, so you can see that in the pre-legislation period, they don't differ a lot. They are the same. This is how we set up the synthetic control countries. And in the post-legislation period, they start to dif uh, differ. And this is what we call the policy impact. So. Based on this, we estimated that the small pre legislation was followed by an annual 1.6% decrease in neonatal mortality. Uh, so this uh, annually and 1.3% uh, uh, decrease in infant mortality annually. So this was about small pre legislation, uh, but there are other policies and uh, probably the, the most effective one is uh, uh, raising uh, cigarette taxes. So we had this uh, paper also, which looked into the global impact of increasing cigarette taxes with um, uh, colleagues from Imperial College. Um, and uh, uh, Jasper Bain from Erasmus MC. Uh, and what we did here is that we did fixed effect panel regressions and we uh, looked how much uh, increasing 10% uh, the cigarette taxes is associated with uh, lower neonatal and infant mortality. Um, and we find that the, there was a strong association uh, for both decreasing neonatal and uh, infant mortality. And uh, this association was stronger in low and middle income countries. Um, and there was a dose response effect. Uh, and uh, all of there was no, all of the taxes, the type of taxes, so specific tax, ad valorem, import duties, all of them uh, were associated with the uh, decrease in infant and neonatal mortality. And then we we estimated that what would happen in a hypothetical world where all of a sudden all countries increased uh, their taxes to the recommended seventy five percent. And we find that annually, uh, based on our estimation, annual, annually over 200 uh, um, infant death could have been averted. Um, so that's a lot if they do this. Uh, yes, and then we had um, a micro simulation. This was uh, also done by Esper Bain and uh, Timor uh, Faber. And the the idea here was that uh, we estimated the impact of tobacco taxes for different outcomes, uh, but in the overall and long-term health benefit uh, uh, was missing. So uh, previous micro simulation models uh, mostly looked into adult health outcomes. So we calibrated this micro simulation model for uh, estimating the overall long-term impact of uh, 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 tobacco policies on child health outcomes. And basically what this model does is that we follow up a synthetic population from fetal life to childhood. So the child, the, the fetus first has a, a risk to burn preterm uh, or term or born dead. And then uh, they have a risk for die uh, in the first 30 days or um, uh, go to the pediatric mod, um, mod part of the model where they have a certain risk for getting admitted uh, to hospitals for asthma or respiratory, uh, respiratory tract infection. And 
and this risk based on whether they were born preterm or term. And uh, here is a bit about the, the findings. So um, we estimated the number of the deaths and the number of total hospitalizations. Uh, okay, and the last question is that I talked a little bit about that um, these oh, smoke-free policies are uh, usually estimated for enclosed public uh, uh, places, but there are other places which are extending to private and outdoor places, but the systematic uh, overview was missing. So this is what we did, and here Famke Molenberg was the, the other lead author here. Uh, and uh, we identified basically 11 studies and seven uh, fit uh, for the uh, first specified criteria. Uh, five of them investigated smoke-free cars. Uh, one of them investigated a smoke-free school policy and uh, one comprehensive policy covering multiple areas, including outdoor places. So we could, based on this, um, with the results in the meta-analysis for the smoke-free car policies and uh, and the, their impact on uh, tobacco smoke exposure in children or children in the car. And uh, we find a considerable reduction when we considered uh, all of this evidence here. Uh, and then we translated this uh, we, we estimated how uh, that this translates to uh, 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 0 0.2 to a 2.4 percent decrease in asthma di diagnosis. Uh, this level of tobacco smoke uh, exposure in cars, which doesn't sound a lot, but given the high uh, global burden of uh, asthma, this is considerable effect. And there were some studies for outdoor policies, but not enough to uh, come. Uh, for any conclusion regarding them. Okay, so this was um, my postdoc project at, in, uh, at Erasmus MC and uh, now at uh, Karolinska Institute. And uh, I lead a project about uh, social networks and uh, what's the role of social networks in um, health inequalities. Uh, and basically what... Uh, what I showed you before is that these population level uh, uh, policies were really good at decreasing uh, uh, smoking inequality, and de decreasing smoking prevalence and uh, increasing uh, child, improving child health outcomes, but they were not that good in uh, decreasing smoking inequalities. So they were mostly effective among the uh, high income population. And um, yeah, there are different reasons why this could be. I investigated one uh, uh, factor, uh, the, the meso factor, so the social networks. And uh, basically uh, here, what we did is that we knew that smoking spreads in the network, but, there were, but it was still unclear how smoking spreads in a social economically segregated network. Uh, so this is what we looked at, and this is very important because there are uh, these network-based interventions which use these uh, uh, social network studies to intervene, and they were mostly successful. So there is uh, this ASSIS try is I think the one of the most uh, um, famous one, but uh, even this ASSIS try which looked at how uh, a network-based intervention can uh, decreased smoking prevalence among adolescents, they didn't look into how it could reduce smoking inequalities. And um, that's the motivation to inform a policy intervention and uh, show this. So what we did is we tried to disentangle social network mechanisms uh, to develop a uh, policy intervention. And this is the first paper that we had here, which was published uh, uh, not too long ago uh, in addiction, uh, but I will present um, a new finding about ethnic inequalities. This was about social uh, income inequalities. So the theoretical background, basically uh, uh, social networks can create uh, inequalities in smoking in four ways. So um, it could uh, increase inequalities if smoking spreads 
in a segregated network. Smoking can spread in two ways. At first, if um, I influence you, I'm a smoker and I influence you to smoke, then smoking will spread. The other thing is that um, uh, the way how it could uh, um, spread in the network, if I'm a smoker and I'm extremely popular, so others want to be uh, popular too, so they will start to smoke. So this is basically the two mechanisms. The segregated networks means that um, people from similar background, social economical background, ethnic background will uh, interact with each other more often or befriend each other more often. So if these two uh, things stands, then we know that inequalities will accelerate. The other thing which hasn't been uh, investigated for health outcome is a so-called oppositional culture theory, which was developed for um, mostly for um, uh, academic outcomes, but it could be applied for health inequities also. So this one states uh, basically that if a minority students start to study well or do something which is against the school norm, um, like uh, not smoke or not, not to drink alcohol, then the minority group will exclude them. So this is a, another way how it could happen. And the fourth one is what we call uh, selection to fossil. This just preassume that people who meet more often, like they smoke together, uh, has higher chance to interact and uh, be friend. And, and this could also accelerate smoking inequalities if uh, this smoking is the bridge, only bridge between majority and minority students. So what we had is that we collected longitudinal network data in 52 uh, high schools in Hungary. Uh, we investigated uh, the, uh, one of the outcome was friendship, the other was smoking. Um, and uh, the individual characteristics which we um, looked into was smoking, ethnicity. So there are the, the biggest ethnic, uh, minority in Hungary I think minorities are Roma students. And um, uh, we had uh, data about whether somebody is Roma or non-Roma and gender. And we conducted the longitudinal network analysis using multi-group uh, method. This method basically produced something very similar to a regression model, but it simultaneously uh, uh, models two outcomes. So on the one hand, we look into how uh, smoking, smoking behavior changes in the individual. And the other hand, we are looking into whether friendship tie formation changes. Um, based on, uh, this is based on structural characteristics, network characteristics. For example, um, we know that if I uh, befriend Wendy, then Wendy will uh, have higher risk to befriend me too. Um, this is one structural characteristic which we consider and individual factors. And here we consider two types of individual factors. So the person, the ego who sends the tie and the person who is the author who received the tie. And we look into whether the, for example, the author characteristic could be whether the author is a smoker, is he or she is gonna receive more ties. So this is the outcome, but I will explain it a bit. So you can see that there is a friendship dynamic part and the smoking dynamic part of the model, here are the structural effects, and here are the uh, characteristics of the people. So this is pretty similar to uh, a regression, just instead of one person, you have two people's characteristics. And this part is uh, really similar to the, the smoking dynamics part is really similar to a fixed effect model. Mm, so basically what we find is that smoking spreads, uh, smoking, uh, uh, spreads because uh, smokers are popular. We also found that uh, the network is segregated, so Roma people have um, um, higher risk to nominate other Romas, and uh, non-Romas um, tend to nominate uh, non-Romas as friends. Mm, there is a very good news. We didn't find opposition oppositional culture, and I say that it's very, very good. Uh, because it's very, very hard to change it with policy measures. But we find something else. We find that uh, actually it's the uh, non-Romas who exclude uh, Romas who don't smoke. So this is a bit of uh, evidence for 
this selection to foresee. So maybe smoking is the one which can bridge ethnic divide. And if aroma doesn't smoke, then they are left excluded. So this is what we find here, that uh, non-Romas tend to uh, nominate Romas. This is just uh, instead of uh, interpreting the three bay interactions, this is just a table to explain. So here is what we find. Uh, we, the, the results shows that social networks contribute to inequalities in uh, health behaviors. Uh, and uh, we find that it contributes because the network is segregated and because a uh, majority group excludes minority people who don't smoke. Uh, and these are uh, characteristics uh, which could be addressed by uh, um, potential network-based intervention. And we could develop network-based in interventions which not only aim to reduce smoking, in a, a smoking prevalence in general, but also decrease inequalities. And it's very important to emphasize that one, one size may not fit all ethnic groups. Uh, so uh, we need to have a smart strategy for this. And uh, most recently, I got um, two grants uh, uh, to extend this work. So I will just talk very, very briefly about what are these projects. So what we, uh, the first one is from um, Forte, which is a Swedish grant agency. Uh, basically what we, we did before and what I just presented is that we always looked into how smoking spreads in the network, uh, but there are new alternative nicotine products and uh, uh, there hasn't been any complete social network data collection to my knowledge, which distinguish between these two. And complete social network data is very important to be able to distinguish the network mechanisms. Uh, complete, complete social network data means that we know the relationship between each member of the population. So uh, this is one. And the other is that there uh, has been only uh, some studies for complete social network data for uh, uh, looking into online interactions also, uh, but these were for university students. So this is what we will do. We will collect uh, uh, data from online and we will distinguish uh, different network mechanisms. And uh, so we will collect this data in Sweden and then analyze them with uh, social network analysis methods. And the other project is that um, mm, we know that, uh, that there, there is an other type of complete social network. And this is embedded in the uh, population level networks. Uh, so in Sweden, the there is very detailed administrative data. So we know exactly uh, where people live. So I can tell who is, who is neighbor with whom. And this is for the whole population of Sweden. We know who is the family members. So we can construct uh, the family network. We know uh, who works together, so we can construct a colleague, colleague network. But I even know who goes to the same prison, so we can construct even a prison network. And we will use this population level social networks to understand how um, fertility behavior uh, spreads in the segregated social networks. So this is the second project which I got funded. And uh, thank you so much. Um, Wendy. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so now uh, we'll take questions. So if anyone has any question, uh, since we're a small group, if you want, you could just raise your hand uh, or if you're more comfortable, you can enter your question in the Q&A feature. So I guess it was a very clear talk. I don't see any questions. We can wait. Uh, a few more, a, a couple more minutes. Um, but uh, if not, uh, Martha, I just want to thank you very much for your presentation today. And uh, I guess uh, for everyone else who's very quiet and has no questions, uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you, Emily. Okay, thank you.